Good evening, everyone. Tonight's shiur is called A Spiritual High from the Physical Low. Prit Sadiq, a book called Prit Sadiq, written by the famed great master, Rabbi Tzadik Tzadok HaKohen Milublin. He explains a fascinating Zohar <coughs> on Parashat Vayikra, <coughs> in the Torah portion reading of Vayikra. that makes a connection between four concepts. And those four concepts are the incense. The incense were 11 spices, one of the most holiest of the gifts or sacrifices, if you like, that was brought up on the, the inner altar was the gift the daily gift, and particularly on Yom Kippur, which was, had even greater significance, of the 11 spices in the morning and in the afternoon. 11 spices. The incense, ketoret in Hebrew. There, there is another sacrifice called shelamim, the peace offering, which came for various reasons. Um, quite often as a donation or a gift or a thanksgiving. It's called shelamim, a peace offering. Why is it called peace offering? <coughs> shelamim, because it brings shalom, it brings peace. <coughs> Who does it bring peace with? Well, the sacrifice that is offered, part of it goes to the Kohanim as their rightful gift. Part of it is burnt on the altar, so to speak, uplifting the animalistic and physical world up to Hashem. So a part for the altar, a part for the Kohanim. And a part of that, the rest, the leftover, was for the family, for the members of the family to eat. To eat in Jerusalem, to enjoy, to, to feast, so to speak, and to, um, to enjoy their coming to Jerusalem and their offering and their gift to Hashem, so to speak. In the festivals, by the way, shlamim were offered, what's called the hagiga, the usually, the usually the first days of the festival. And also, um, when you wanted to eat, you know, if you stayed there for a prolonged period of time, and you had uh, many members of your family, you would then bring up many such peace offerings in order that your food, your eating, would not just be ordinary eating, it'd be sacrificial eating, so to speak, holy eating, because part of it, as I said before, is on the altar, part of it the Kohanim, and part of it is eaten by you, as opposed to just having a nice salami sandwich <coughs> in, um, <laughs> in Jerusalem. So that's the Shlamim. Then the Zohar makes a connection between Yaakov Avinu, our forefather Jacob, the third forefather, and the Shabbat. We'll soon see what is the connection between those four. In the first instance, we have to explain what is the incense, what is the, this holy service in the temple that is called the incense. The incense had 11 spices. Ten of them were very good smelling. One of them was foul smelling. I'm not going to speak at length about it because I spoke about it on previous occasion. I think one of the shiurim is called Do the Wicked do sinners have a place in God's world? I think that may be connected, if I remember correctly, that may be, may, may be connected to the concept of, the, uh, of the, the spices. So I'll just speak about it very briefly because I want to focus on the other things that have similar themes. So basically, there were 10 samimanim, 10 spices that were very good smelling, and one was a foul smelling one. Why would you bring into the temple foul smelling? A foul smell. That's question number one. And question number two, we know that everything <coughs> in Judaism works in ten. As we will soon see. <clears throat> why, why eleven? When we say everything works in ten, we know that the ten emanations of God are ten. Ten is a unifying number. It's a unified number. Whereas in the, in the incense, the number eleven. The number eleven in fact, 
signifies impurity, as it says in Kabbalistic writings, the 11 crowns of impurity. So we see that there is a connection between impurity and the number 11, as opposed to unity and holiness and purity, which is symbolized by the number 10. Why is the number 11 symbolic of impurity or the other side? Very simple. The Kabbalists teach us, Arizal teach us, <clears throat> teaches us that there has, for there to be a tikkun, for there to be a rectification of all worlds, there has to be a unity between the light and the vessels. Which means that the light must be in accordance with the vessels and the vessels must be capable and refined enough to receive that particular level of light, whichever level of light it may be, higher or lower. <clears throat> <clears throat> Let us speak in the higher realms, in the higher levels. For there to be a proper entity, for there to be tikkun, for there to be a rectification or a completion, there has to be a unity and a harmony between vessel and or and light. And that and all holiness and all purity stems from that level of unification, where everything is unified and everything is wholesome and everything is harmonized. There is a world, or a level, it's also a world, but it's within the world of Nekudim, Atzilut, Nekudim, they're all in the same world, but same station, so to speak, but it is a sub-level, a sub-world, what's called the world of Shvirat HaKelim. The breaking, the shattering of vessels. What does that mean? Uh, so that is all explains that there existed an entity, there God created an entity by which the light was so powerful and the vessels were um, insufficient to receive that light. A. B. There was no proper harmony between all levels. And because of that, that caused a disunity or a division between the light and the vessels. And thus the vessel, so to speak, shattered. And we don't have the time to explain what does it mean, shattered. We're talking about spiritual concepts. But we're you borrowing, like always, we're borrowing physical terminology to understand a little bit something that is very holy and sublime. These broken or shattered vessels are the source of impurity in this world. And I'm not going to explain more, more than that. I explained it on a previous occasion and it's too lengthy for me to go on about it because again, I don't want to make the whole shield just about it. But what I do want to explain is as follows. How, this disharmony or impurity or concealment of godliness, so particularly in the realm of impurity, lack of sanctity is where there is division. That the concealment of God is so great that there is room for division, there is room for, 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 for a person to even think that there is room for plural God or, or an ego. That all comes from that same level. Where there's a division and between, there's no harmony, there's no unity between me and God, so to speak. Not that I don't believe in God, but there is a disunity, there's a distraction, there's a, a, a discord. It's division. And the source of that was the division of the light and the vessels. What's this got to do with everything? So basically, there are ten lights. But they were distinct, and each was for itself, and there was not a true harmony. Thus was introduced the concept of eleven. Because each one was an entity for itself, so to speak. The lights were, were, were not harmonized. Each one was distinct. In other words, Chokhmah was pure Chokhmah. Bina was pure Bina. Wisdom was pure Wisdom. Understanding was pure understanding, kindness, pure kindness, severity, pure severity, wasn't harmonized, wasn't, didn't have a bit of each. Bear with me for those who are not familiar or don't remember or, you know, what we've explained before about this topic. But that's basically what I want to explain, that there's, there was a distinction between the vessels and the light. 
And thus you have 10 plus 1. No proper harmony. Where there's proper harmony, there's only the number 10. Comes the incense to rectify this. Now the source of all impurity and the source of death comes from impurity, of course, because death, impurity does not endure. And therefore anybody who imbibes, like the apple, the tree of knowledge of good and bad, becomes a part of them, cannot exist forever. Because impurity cannot endure, does not endure, doesn't have a, it's a means to an end, doesn't have a purpose and an existence for, in and of itself. And therefore cannot exist forever, does not endure. It's only here for us to be able to refine, to connect to Hashem on a deeper level, to test us, to bring up out our inner strength that lies within, etc. Okay? The incense came to combat that. And that's why there was the number 11. And that's why there was the symbolism of that one foul smelling represent the impurities of the world. The lack. The, in other words, it was distinct from the other 10. The other 10 were, were good smelling and one was foul smelling, which means again, you've got the number 10 and, and 11. But mixing them all together and bringing it into the temple and bringing it up to Hashem rectifies that lofty level in heaven. Fixes that level, so to speak. We down below harmonize. We down below have the ability to rectify the shattered shards. We have the ability to put things together. We have the ability to, to harmonize and to unify when we direct our attention to God. Says the Holy Zohar, a very interesting thing, that when the inauguration of the tabernacle, so the princes of the 12 tribes of Israel brought many gifts to the tabernacle. Amongst those gifts were 12 golden spoons that contained the incense. And there it says that the spoons weighed 10 shekel, 10 shekel per piece. The Torah repeats itself. Ten shekel, ten shekel per piece. Why does the Torah have to repeat itself? Ten shekel, ten shekel per piece. Ten shekel. Zohar says, Rabbi Shimbari Yohai says, here lies a deep lesson. The ten ten is the two important ten numbers that we have. The ten emanations, which then translated as they, so to speak, descended from spiritually lofty levels into the ten utterances of creation. Let there be light, etc. The ten utterances that brought creation into being, into a physical world. They are rooted in the ten emanations of God. These are the ten utterances. And then there are Ten Commandments. It says Rabbi Shimbar Yochai, the Ten Commandments give the world its potential to reach its highest spiritual level, its highest tikkun, its highest completion, its highest rectification, highest harmony. What brings fulfillment to the world, what brings completeness to the world are the Ten Commandments. When you harmonize the two, that is when you get the completeness of this world. The question is, that's an important lesson. It's a valuable lesson. And we know such is the case. Makes sense. But why is it taught here? Why is it taught specifically in the spoons that contain the incense? Because here lies the reason and the purpose of the whole Torah. And the reason and the purpose of the whole Torah and the creation of the world is not just for there to be spirituality. It's not just for there to be holiness, but for, the, for there to be concealment of godliness, for there to be, so to speak, a foul smell in the world, something, something negative, for there to be impurity, for there to be um, impulse and, and sensation and and, and pleasures and desires, and notwithstanding that, overcoming it, and defying that, and presenting ourselves to Hashem. 
And if God forbid we ever fail, through repentance we uplift and purify even that foul smell that became attached to ourselves. As the Zohar says, Rabbi Shim Bar Yochai says, there is no light greater than the light that emanates from darkness. There is no light greater than the light that emanates from darkness. How can light emanate from darkness? Sometimes through darkness you appreciate the light greater. Especially when you bring light to the darkness, to the dark places, to the dark crevices of our lives, our insecurities, our difficulties, our weaknesses. That is the incense. Where we bring before Hashem, we say, Hashem, we may have some foul elements to our lives. We have some disunity. The number 11 represents disunity, discord, where there is no true unity between me and my inner self, my soul, where there is no true unity between me and God, where there is no true unity between the ten emanations of God and the Ten Commandments, the Torah, coming together, harmonizing each other. But there is division, there is eleven, there is division. There is ego, where God is a, is a so to speak, a distinct part of me, a, a separate part of me, detached, he's detached from me. Which is the challenge that we all go through, because the truth is, is that we, the majority of people believe in God. The, the challenge is to make God real and relevant and so uni- that we recognize God's unity and oneness in the world. That the world is inseparable from God and we are inseparable from God. That is a challenge, to feel that and then thus to behave in that manner. That is the challenge. And the physicality itself belies all of this. It's a facade. We look at the physical world, we, we relate to physicality, and we forget about the spirituality, we forget about the divine spark that, that animates it. And sometimes, quite often, we get so caught up in the material world that we become so material and so gross. So we come before God, and we bring that, we recognize that, we acknowledge that, and we bring it as a gift in the holy in the inner part of the sanctuary, not the Holy of Holies, but the inner part where only the Kohanim can go. On the golden altar. And the incense are presented and brought up. It's interesting to note that in Aramaic, the word for bond, connection, kesher, a kesher, a unity, is ketar. Ketar. Which is very much related to the Hebrew word. That's Aramaic. And Aramaic and Hebrew are very close. Ketoret. Ketoret is the word for incense. Which means that through the incense, through the fact that we live in this gross material world that has this foul or divisive nature to it, through it we can come to a closer bond, a higher bond with Hashem. And as I mentioned to you previously, what the Zohar HaKadosh Rabbi Shem Hai says, there is no light greater than the light that emanates from darkness. And then he says, there is no goodness greater than the goodness that comes forth from evil. When you overturn evil, when you battle within yourself, don't give up. Because many people just give up and give in and say, well, that's who I am, that's what I am. You know, I'm good at this, I'm good at that, but that's who I am and that's what I am and that's all there is. And for this reason, the, um, the incense was from the greatest of all sacrifices, was the precious of all sacrifices. It says that in the Zohar, Rabbi Shimbayo Hai says that that was the most precious of all sacrifices. That was the most precious of all gifts. When a person comes to Hashem with a contrite heart, he may have sinned, he may have some, something foul about him, he may have done something wrong, he may have followed his ego, 
Because ultimately, when we, when we do something not in accordance with the divine will, we are placing our ego, our will, what I desire, before the desire of the Almighty God. That's a clash. But when a person comes with a contrite heart and becomes aware of that, nothing is greater than that. Nothing is holier than that. Nothing, nothing is more sublime than that. No light is greater than the light that comes from darkness. No good is greater than the good that comes from evil. And that's why particularly the incense is so holy. And that's why we learn the lesson of the harmony and unity of Torah with the world, with the physical material world, that the material world is a facade, is a concealment of godliness, is the very cause of that foulness, so to speak, of the, in the world. The very cause that allures us to materialism and draws us away from spirituality. We like the drink, we like the food, we like the, 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 the relaxation, we like the this, we like the that. It's a battle to go to a shiur, it's a battle to go to the, the synagogue. Yeah, and we don't always enjoy it, and the guy next to me he was uh, nudging me, and the air conditioner wasn't on good enough, and there's always all the excuses. When someone comes from a holiday, how was your holiday? Great. No complaints. The room was nice. The bed was good, the food was great, the view was great. Ask him, how was Shul today? Ah, don't ask. Shmendrick was sitting next to me on my left. The guy on my right was too loud, he was blowing my ear off. And the guy behind me had a cold, I was sniffling after all of this, I've got a sore throat now. The air conditioner wasn't working properly. The rabbi's shiur was too short, it should have been much longer, the rabbi's darush. I don't know why he gives such short darush, he should speak for much longer. <laughs> That's the usual complaint, no, the rabbi's darush, no, the rabbi's sermons, no, they speak too short, no, they speak too short. People are thirsting for Torah, they want to hear more and more, every minute is precious. Why did he speak so short? <clears throat> the Kiddush was lousy, till I got to the Kiddush everything was gone. That's how it is. The materialism, the material world is very attractive. It's very easy. Everything is easy. Everything is so easily found. You, you feel like nibbling something, no problem. It's not like those days they barely had bread. And they, you feel like nibbling something, no, go open the pantry. You'll find something to nibble on. You'll find something to eat. You'll find something to satisfy yourself. I, I, you had dinner two hours ago. You're okay. You don't need to eat. You don't need to drink right now. You're fine. No, I need to have something. I need to do Rarely do we say, oh, I, need, I, need a, I need another shiur before I go to bed. I need another, I need something. I need to study a bit more. I need to read a bit more Tehillim this morning before I go to work just to strengthen my emunah and akadosh baruch It doesn't happen unless we work hard. It doesn't come natural. And there's nothing, there's no greater gift when you give it that it doesn't come natural. With hard work, with toil, and you had to overcome to come to a shiur. You had to, you had to work hard. You had to work hard to go to the synagogue for service. It was an effort. It was a toil. You had to work hard to overcome that inhibition or that or that particular thing that you wanted to do or wanted to have, and you knew it wasn't in accordance with the divine will, and you let it go. Oh, God forbid, you knew that you didn't let it go, but you come with a contrite heart and you regret it. And you begin to become one with Hashem and His divine will, even momentarily, even a little bit. That is so worthwhile. It is so worthwhile that it's worthwhile for God to create the whole heaven and earth just for that. And let's move on. The Zohar makes a connection between another sacrifice, the sacrifice of Shlamim, as we said before. So those who are, who are familiar a little bit with the sacrifice know that the, the highest sacrifice or the most holiest sacrifice, and it makes a difference, the level of sanctity, because <clears throat> there are many laws that, <clears throat> excuse me, there are many laws that apply uh, differently to because of the level of sanctity. For example, the Allah sacrifice, it's Kulola Hashem. The whole sacrifice, you know, the, the morning and the afternoon sacrifice, that's 
Ola, you have in the Musafim, in the Shabbat, and the festivals, you also have many Olot sacrifices. Ola means an, uh, an, an uh, elevated offering, because the whole thing is, is offered to Hashem. It's all pure. Yitzhak Avinu, our forefather Yitzhak, is called Ola Temima, a, a pure, a pure uh, uh, Ola, a pure upliftment gift to Hashem. Because Yitzhak was, was, uh, was born through a miracle, A. B, he was put on the altar before God. And because of that, he was never allowed to leave Eretz Israel, the land, the Holy Land. He's like fully pure, fully holy. He wasn't allowed to leave the Holy Land. <clears throat> In fact, when there was a famine, God told him, you stay right here. You stay right here. You're not like your father, Abraham, that you can go. Or later on, Yaakov, that went out of Israel and then went to Egypt. He went to Lavan and then went to Egypt. You're not like Yaakov. You have to stay here. You are pure. You are fully to Hashem. You have to stay in Eretz Israel. Your place is in Israel. You can't go to, uh, you can't go to the Bahamas. Bahamas is, not, <clears throat> Bahamas is not for you, Yitzhak Abin. You can't go to Hawaii. You can't go to Fiji. You have to stay right over here. <clears throat> this is Yitzhak Avinu. That's compared to the Aula. The Aula is Kula la Hashem. All of it is offered on the, on the altar. None of it to the Kohanim. None of it to the donation to, to the donor. If you bring Aula, if you bring a sacrifice, I want to bring a gift to Hashem, all to Hashem. All to Hashem. You can't partake and give some to your family. It's all to Hashem. It's a much, it has much more sanctity and it has different halachic ramifications. And cannot be taken out of the, of the temple. Whereas, whereas a shelamim, a gift offering or a peace offering, what's called a peace offering, the rest of it can be taken out. It's called kochim kalim, lesser or lighter holiness. And ola is called kochia kodashim, it's more holy. Despite that, says the Zohar, the most cherished of sacrifices is the Shlamim. Why is the Shlamim more cherished than the Ola? The Ola is all for Hashem. Why is it more cherished? Precisely because you're going to eat some of it. Precisely because the Kohanim gets some. Precisely because you're going to sit with your family and going to introduce some holiness into your table. Precisely because of that. Precisely because you live in the physical world and you have a family and you have to earn a living and you're introducing holiness in that realm too, not just in the temple, not something that is only for Hashem. You're taking some of that sacrificial meat, so to speak, some of that holiness and you're bringing it to your home and you're aware of that and you eat it with the right approach. Well, that is something that is very unique, says the Zohar. That is, that is, in fact, the reason why God created the world. That godliness will penetrate the physical and the mundane. And that's why the Shlamim is called Shlamim. Shlamim comes from the expression Shalom or Shalem, complete. Tikkun means... Even though there are higher levels and higher realms, tikkun means rectification, means when there is harmony, when there is unity. When there is harmony and unity between the ten utterances of creation and the ten commandments, the physical world and the spiritual world. When there is a harmony between body and soul, the divine will and the material world, there is no conflict, there is no contradictions. What did the holy Rabbi Shimbar Yahai say? There is no greater good than the good that comes from bad. There is no greater light than the light that comes from darkness. This world is a world of darkness. It conceals godliness. And you take that meat and you make it holy meat, you make it sacrificial meat. Nothing more precious than that. That is the purpose of creation. Let's take that a step further. Out of all of the forefathers, who was the one that most embodied that concept, that idea? Not Yitzhak Avinu. Even though he was holy of holies. 
pure and precious, a person who was willing at age 30, in his 30s, to be presented before Hashem on an altar lovingly, without any uh, dispute or discord with his father. 30 year old, his father taking a 30 year old. He wasn't a little kid. He wasn't a little kid. How old was he? Was he 32? 30? How much? 33, wasn't he? I can't remember now. I'm not good with numbers. He was 32, 33 years old. By the Chushnei Mihadav, and they went together with peace, with harmony, with one mission in mind, and that is to serve God. And if it, it's God's will, despite everything that we understood, that doesn't make sense what God just commanded. That Abraham should, should bring me up as a sacrifice, and I should agree to that? Doesn't make sense, yet he lovingly did so. He did look at his father and said, Are you off your rocker? God forbid if you tell one little thing to the younger generation, one little thing that doesn't uh, sit well with them, God forbid, are you off your rocker? Have you fallen on your head? God forbid. And all it was was, can you move the cup to the right so it doesn't fall? You know, you know how we always, parents always said, move your cup, don't leave it like that, and fall on that. They don't care. They don't have to clean the, <laughs> the thing later on. We do it. So you like to tell him just for, already that, that's already a parasha. God forbid if you tell him something, you know, maybe you should study a bit more, maybe you should come on time to prayers or whatever it is. Taking a 30 so year old, and that's when they're, uh, the age is getting less and less when they, uh, when they, uh, you know, tell you off or disagree. <clears throat> I've noticed. It used to be in those days, you know, basically when you're 21, you know, then you say, look, I'm 21. Then it became 18. Then it became 16. Then it became 14. Then it became 12. Where is it holding today? <clears throat> Where is it holding today where they tell you, you off your rocker? It's not a joke. And he has something, in his, someone in his 30s. And all his desire is exactly as his father. To go and to serve God. That's all he cares about. That's all he wants. He is pure. He is holy. But Yaakov Aminu has something special. Something different. And he was able to enclose himself in Lavan's house who lived outside of the land of Israel. Lavan, a deceiver, difficult man, difficult to deal with him. Everything was about rotting the system. How to take, how to get better, how to enrich oneself, how to get power, greed. And he had to live with this man. For 20 years he had to live with this man. Difficult. And yet he was able to come out pure. And he was able to bring up 12 tribes of Israel, all pure, all holy. That is remarkable. That is Shlamim. That is the unity of two worlds. He's not a Yitzhak. He's not the Ola Temima. He's not this sacrifice that is all for Hashem, all of it in the inner sanctuary, in the, in the, on the altar. He's out there. He's like the Shlamim, the peace offering. Where they all come together in beautiful, perfect harmony and unity, recognizing the oneness of God wherever he went, which any situation he was. And then he went down to Egypt, the more, even more decadent than Lavan, a decadent society. And what happens there? All of his children are pure. All of his children are, willing, are able to overcome the influences of the society of that time. Scholars, teachers, pure. That is Yaakov, like the Shlamim. Now you understand the connection between, and the Zohar makes a connection between these three concepts. There's one more concept that very much symbolizes all of this, <clears throat> and that is the Shabbat. 
the Shabbat symbolizes this very concept. During the week, we're not permitted to indulge because there's a danger in indulging. And the danger is that we become too enclosed in the materialism of the world that we become indulged in. It's like, you, it's like you, you're getting dressed. You know, you, how you look is what, what you dress, what, what, what you're wearing. The garments that you are wearing. If the garments are impure, if the garments represent division, then you are division. If the garments represent impure, you're impure. If you're wearing dirty garments, or disgusting garments, tattered garments, you're a, you're a, you're a pauper. I mean, maybe, maybe you're not, but that's what you look like. That's what you're projecting. If you wear princely garments, oh, this guy is probably a prince. So too in the spiritual realm. If you wear holy garments, you're holy. Despite the fact that we live in the material world. And those garments are the expressions of who we are and what we are. And they are three. Thought, speech, and action. They are the garments of the soul, right? How we think, what we think, what we say, what we feel, saying, and what we feel is very similar. They're connected. And what we do. They are the garments. And if they're good, these are the garments that we put on. Nice, good clothing. And if not, then, then the clothing that we wear are divisive and not unifying. So during the weekday, we have to be careful not to overindulge. Be careful. Be careful because we have a, a um, tendency to want this, want more, nicer, greater, bigger, more luxurious, another car, another this, another that, another. And we go from one to the other, one to the other. We, do we need all of the things that we really desire? And we want and we're working so hard for and killing ourselves for do we actually need it? Does it make it does it really make that much more of a difference to our life? So minuscule that was it worth all the effort and all that enclosing ourselves and engrossing ourselves in what all of these things that we wanted for ourselves? I highly doubt it. I highly doubt it. And people work their lives off, their health away. Spend time that could be spent on spiritual pursuits and refining ourselves and building ourselves and building the world and rectifying the world from one luxury car to the next luxury car. Oh, it's a, it gives you, what does it give you already? Oh, it's nice, but how long is it nice for? And the whole life has to be that. And from one to the other and one to the other. And it's a life wasted. So that's the week that we have to be careful. But Shabbat is different. As it says in Tikkun Zohar, Kad Ail Shabbata. When Shabbat comes in, it becomes unified. With Parashat Misitra Ahra and becomes dislodged from the impurity of the world. Shabbat is a very high level. And automatically it uplifts and takes up the whole world with us. So on Shabbat you can have a fine meal. You can wear beautiful clothes. The nicest clothes that you have. Wear on Shabbat. And there's no danger of arrogance. Because you're honoring the Shabbat. You're honoring the divine presence that reveals itself on Shabbat more. You're honoring the king. When the king comes, you're putting on clothes. Who for? For the king. You want to show him that you respect him. It's not so much for you. You enjoy it. When you, when you wear nice clothes, you enjoy it. But who are you really putting it on for? The king's coming to visit you. You're wearing it for the king. In honor of the king. Even though that maybe some of it is a little bit for you. You like how you look with that nice suit. Beautiful. Lafayette. Lovely. But I'm putting it on for the king ultimately. When I'm eating the meal, I'm enjoying the meal. It's a beautiful Shabbat meal. I like it. My wife made my, my favorite dessert. The nice uh, dish. The nice Moroccan fish. Beautiful. Nice. I like it. I like this more than that. Better than that. And we do it on Shabbat. But who am I doing it for? For the king who's here. And Derech Agav, and, and how do you say Derech Agav in English? And by the way, I'm enjoying it too. But I'm doing it in honor of the king. The divine presence that comes on Shabbat. 
But even deeper than that, the presence of the Holy Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, it almost automatically banishes the, the, the dangers of the world that lies behind the materialism and the facade of the world. It's like you bring a candle into a room, it's like the darkness disappears. No greater light than the light that comes from the darkness, and that's Shabbat. So on Shabbat we eat, we enjoy, we relax. Why? Shlamim. Ketoret. Yaakov. This is Ketar, this is connection. Because we must uplift the material world. We must get as the beginning of the lecture, the name of the lecture, get a spiritual high. And how do you get that spiritual high? From the Shlamim, from the Ketoret, from the Shabbat, from the materialism, materialism of the world, from Yaakov Avinu, what he represented. Despite the fact that the world has a foul element to it. The world has a divisive element to it. We have the power to dispel that disunity and discord. We have the power to unify and unite. And that is symbolized by those four concepts. So enjoy the Shabbat and recognize the power that it brings us not only on that day, because it says in the Zohar, kul ho yamin. All of the coming days of the week are blessed through the Shabbat. It's like the body is blessed through the soul. We are called the children of Israel. Yaakov, his second name, his other name is Yisrael, Bnei Yisrael, the children of Yisrael, of Israel, of Jacob. We, the, we bear his name. We're not called the children of Yitzhak, even though we are. We're not called the children of Abraham, even though we are. We're called Bnei Yisrael. Because he represents that concept that exists within the world and yet be beyond the world simultaneously. Exists within this disunity and discord of the world, yet harmonize and synthesize. Exists within the darkness, yet banish the darkness, bring light to the darkness. There's some foulness to the world, you bring the ten ketoret, the ten spices, the ten semamanim, the ten spices and overcomes that foulness or the negativity that may, may exist in the world. And this is what the Zohar says, that the unifying concepts come together, the ten um, uh, um, utterances of creation with the ten uh, commandments bring the world to a beautiful unity, exactly ten. And that's why it says that when they brought the gift of the twelve spoons containing the incense, each one was ten shekel, ten shekel per piece. That double concept which is symbolized particularly through the incense. Are there any questions?